So we are going to finish section 1.2 and maybe finish set, well, at least get started on section 1.3. This class is kind of, we need emdivation software for our calculators to be installed on this computer. We cannot do Gauss-Jordan elimination by hand every time it shows up. I have submitted work orders explaining this. We're still waiting for something to happen but we can at least we can do today's uh, lecture without that anyway. So to finish up section 1.2, we should talk about the existence and uniqueness of solutions. I mean, I already touched on this looking at R2, but a system of linear equations might not have solutions. And we've given Gauss-Jordan elimination as a method for solving a system of linear equations. So what happens if there aren't solutions or if there are infinitely many solutions? <laughs> Question like that. Let's um let's just take a look at a at a small system first of all. We've never actually solved a system of equations using Gauss-Jordan elimination. So maybe maybe we ought to before we get into more technical questions about what happens if a solution doesn't exist and stuff like that. So there's a system made it up off the top of my head. I assume it will have one solution. Let's see what happens if we try to solve this thing using Gauss-Jordan elimination. So, <clears throat> The method is to store our system as an augmented matrix. And in this augmented matrix, remember that rows represent equations and columns represent variables, except for the last column, which represents equality. I don't know if I've explicitly mentioned this, by the way, but it's the last column that's giving us the augmented in the phrase augmented matrix because you have these columns that represent variables, and then you have that other column stuck on at the end. So to perform Gaussian elimination, we need a non-zero term up there. We have a non-zero term, we have a two, and let's use that two to turn the four to zero. And I don't know how quickly I should be moving through this. If you uh, find this sort of concept easy or if you find it tricky to turn a four to zero, we need a negative four. So if we multiply the first row by negative two, that will give us a negative four. And if we then add this to the second row, That's our new second row, zero, negative 11, negative two. 
And we still have each of these rows representing an equation and these columns are still representing variables. And this is now in row echelon form, but we'll keep going. We'll put it in reduced row echelon form. For reduced row echelon form, we need a one there. So we're going to get some kind of unfortunate fret but if we multiply that second row by negative one eleventh, that negative eleven turns into a one. And now we're going to use this one to get rid of the four. And let me go ahead and write, we are uh, just for ease of mental math. We have a one in the upper right. Let's go ahead and get our common denominator. A one is 11 over 11. So we'll multiply the second row by negative four and add it to the first row. Uh, so when we do that, our second row multiplied by negative four becomes zero, negative four, negative eight elevenths. Our first row is two, four, eleven, elevenths. And our new first row is going to be two, zero, three, elevenths. And once again, every step along the way, the rows continue to represent equations, the columns continue to represent variables, except for the last column, which represents equality. So here's our new First row, here's our second row. You can, by the way, just shout out if you think I'm making some kind of algebraic mistake at any point. I hope I'm not. And again, rows represent equations. Columns represent variables. One last step, and let me there must be a quicker way to erase, but let me go over here. So we go up to the left, we turn this two to a one, we would then use that to get rid of anything above it, but there isn't anything above it. So once we've turned that two into a one, we'll be done. And we'll divide that top row by two to get one, zero, three over 22, zero, one, two over 11. And this is in Gauss door, I mean, this is in reduced row echelon form. We've completed Gauss door in elimination.
But what do I mean when I talk about using Gauss-Jordan elimination to solve the system? How have we solved this system? Well, remember, each of these rows represents a column, each of these I mean, each of these rows represents an equation. The columns represent variables. This first equation says that one X plus zero Y equals three over 22. That second row says zero X plus one y equals two over 11. So you see that once we have this reduced row echelon form, our variables can just be read out. And this is what we get if we have a single solution. We perform Gauss-Jordan elimination, we get something like this. A few uh, words on Gauss-Jordan elimination before I move on. Um, this is not a numerical linear algebra class. So we're not going to questions like exactly what is your calculator doing when we perform Gauss-Jordan elimination on our calculator. We're not going to sort of get bogged down in details. I'm going to make a few comments now, stored in elimination can be made numerically stable in practice. So, what on earth do I mean by that? Well, if you're using a calculator or a computer, you are not working in exact arithmetic, right? Like if you have one third in your calculator, that's just stored as 0 0.3333333. Or maybe there are 16 threes, I forget exactly. But in any event, your calculator stores one third as a decimal. And because of that, your calculator is starting the problem slightly off. The real number is one third. Your calculator has some rounding error in the 17th decimal place. So if you tell your calculator, to do Gauss-Jordan elimination on this. Well, your calculator is going to have rounding error here, and it's going to have rounding error here, and rounding error here, and rounding error here. If I'm, I mean, I think those are the fractions that have infinite decimal expansions, and that will cause rounding error. And then your calculator will perform Gauss-Jordan elimination for you, but because there's already an error here, and there's already an error here, there will be errors when it performs the Gauss-Jordan elimination. And what can sometimes happen with bad numerical algorithms is that very small rounding errors balloon 
one as you perform more and more steps until a rounding error in the 17th decimal place turns into a rounding error in the third decimal place. Stuff like that can happen with a few modifications, which we won't get into, that kind of stuff will not happen with Gauss-Jordan elimination. So if our calculator gives us an answer, we can be pretty confident in that answer. Gauss-Jordan elimination has two parts. We start with a matrix. We put the matrix in row echelon form. And then we put the matrix in reduced row echelon form. And of these two steps, one of them is much slower than the other. Putting the matrix in a row echelon form is relatively slow compared to then putting the matrix in a reduced row echelon form. And the implication for this, of this, for our class is that once we're using our calculators to do row operations, I'm normally just going to put stuff in reduced row echelon form because the amount of time we would save by only using row echelon form is many. Once you're here, in general, you might as well keep going. It's going to be like a thousandth of a second difference on your calculator. And this last statement is going to be relevant for things I'm going to say today. I'm going to talk about what happens if you don't have solutions or if you have infinitely many solutions. And I'm going to state theorems involving row echelon form, but in practice, I'm usually just going to put any matrices I have in reduced row echelon form. It's, there's very little time saved by not going from here to there. So, just a few minor numerical notes. Those weren't very important, but we will come back to this. There are later in the course some algorithms that are genuinely bad in the sense that they're numerically unstable and should not be done on a calculator. And we'll talk about those when they show up. For now, let's ask the question. Well, first let's give some definitions. Let's define a pivot position of a matrix. The pivot positions of a matrix are the locations where the leading entries would be if the matrix were put into row echelon four. 
Before I go any further with that, this is an excellent example of what I was just talking about. To find the pivot positions of a matrix, you need to put it in row echelon form. You don't need to put it in reduced row echelon form. So theoretically, you might say, okay, we should perform Gaussian elimination, but not Gauss-Jordan elimination because we only need it in row echelon form. In practice, I'm basically always going to perform Gauss-Jordan elimination because the difference in the time it takes is negligible. So going back to this definition, I mean, let's go ahead and look at this example. We have a matrix two, four, one. Four, negative three is zero. Remember that the leading entries are the first non-zero entries of our row. So the leading entries of this matrix are that two and this four, but these aren't the pivot positions. The pivot positions are where the leading entries would be if you put the matrix in row echelon form. And if you put the matrix in row echelon form or reduced row echelon form, as the case might be, 0, 1, 3 over 22, One is zero, three over twenty two. Zero, one, something, two elevenths. So when the matrix is put into row echelon form or reduced row echelon form, there is a leading entry and there's a leading entry. So the pivot positions of this matrix are those that I've just put squares around. Um, there is no way of finding pivot positions without doing the row reduction. We're going to be doing a lot of Gauss-Jordan elimination in this class. So anytime we want the pivot positions of a matrix, we have to perform the row reduction. There is no other way to find them. A second definition related to the first, a pivot column is a column with a pivot. position in it. So going back to the previous frame, this matrix has a pivot position in the first column. It has a pivot position in the second 
column. So the first and the second columns are pivot columns. The third column is not. And let me now state a theorem. A system is consistent if and only if The last column of its augmented matrix is not a pivot column. Again, going back to the example we just did, this system is consistent. It does have at least one solution. And when we put this thing in reduced row echelon form, we found that it had a pivot position here and here. Um, so the first column is a pivot column. The second column is a pivot column. The last column is not a pivot column. So this is an example of that theorem in action. The last column is not a pivot column, so it has a solution. Of course, and we're going to see this a lot with the theorems of this course, in order to discover that the last column was not a pivot column, we had to perform Gauss-Jordan elimination. And once we'd performed Gauss-Jordan elimination, we could instantly see that a solution exists and there wasn't any need to cite the theorem. So this sort of thing is going to happen frequently. We have this theorem that tells us whether a solution exists, but to use the theorem, we have to do all the work that goes into finding a solution. There is no way to know going into the problem whether a solution will exist or not. So it's a kind of awkward situation. But let's see this theorem in action. I mean, I guess we've seen it in action. Let's see it in action again. Why does this theorem work? What happens if the last column is a pivot column? Well, let's look at an inconsistent system. X plus Y equals one, two X plus two Y equals three. Let's try to solve this system of equations using Gaussian or Gauss-Jordan elimination. We set up the augmented matrix. We remember that every row 
of the augmented matrix corresponds to an equation. And every column corresponds to a variable except for the last column, which corresponds to equality. And we will multiply the first row by negative two and add it to the second row. We get zero, zero, one. And our rows still correspond to equations. Our columns still correspond to variables. And this matrix is in row echelon form. So we can see where the leading entries of this matrix are. The leading entries of this matrix are those that I've circled. Meaning that those are the pivot positions of the augmented matrix. And the pivot columns the pivot columns are the first column and the last column. So according to our theorem, the last column being a pivot column should mean there is no solution. Well, the second um, equate, the second row corresponds to an equation. What equation does it correspond to? It corresponds to zero X plus zero Y equals one. And of course, there's no value of X and Y that can possibly make this true. I mean, this, this equation is just the flatly false statement that zero equals one. And when the last column is a pivot column, that means you get a row that looks like this after you perform elimination. The last column being a pivot column means that all of the entries that correspond to variables are zero. And then the entry that corresponds to a quality is something other than zero. And when we rewrite this as an equation, we get the clear the false statement that a bunch of zeros added together equals something other than zero. And because that equality cannot possibly be true, the system has no solutions. Does that make sense to each of you? Let's talk about infinitely many solutions then. We've said there are three cases that a system can have one solution, no solution, or infinitely many solutions. We have seen what happens if there is one solution, and we've seen what happens if there are no solutions. To talk about infinitely many solutions, we're going to need 
some more terminology. Every variable in a system of linear equations is going to be classified in one of two ways. Every variable is going to be called basic or free. A variable is going to be called basic if it corresponds to a pivot column. To clarify that a little, we have these columns. I mean, we have this augmented matrix, and we found that it has a pivot column here. The first column is a pivot column, and it has a pivot column here. The third column is a pivot column. We also know that except for the last column, which corresponds to a quality, Every column corresponds to a variable. So this first column corresponds to the variable X. And we say that X is a basic variable because the column that corresponds to it is a pivot column. On the other hand, Y is not basic because the column that corresponds to Y is not a pivot column. Now well, you can probably guess if columns that correspond to pivot columns are called basic. And I only have one other word written on the board. A variable is called free if it does not correspond to a pivot. So going back to this example, X is basic, Y is free, because X corresponds to a pivot column and Y does not. The intuition you should have for basic and free variables is that a basic variable acts like a dependent variable in the college algebra. And a free variable acts like an independent variable in the college algebra. And sort of maintaining this metaphor that basic variables are dependent and free variables are independent. If you have a linear equation, that only has one variable that only has to work um, X. This has one 
solution if you have dependent and independent variables mixed together, then there are infinitely many solutions. All of the points on a line are the solution to that second equation. So with this as our guide, we have infinitely many solutions when two things have to happen here. First of all, The system has to be consistent. If there aren't any solutions, it hardly makes sense to talk about having infinitely many solutions. So remember that last column cannot be a pivot column. Second condition, there has to be at least one free variable. And if both those conditions are satisfied, there are infinitely many solutions. Let's go back to the systems we've looked at today. This system does not have infinitely many solutions. It has no solutions. This system does have a free variable. Y is free but it's not consistent. The last column is um, a pivot column. So it falls down on the first step. This system is consistent. Our last column is not a pivot column. The pivot positions are here this two and this negative three, but also there aren't any free variables. This variable X has this pivot position two, so this is a pivot column. This variable Y has this pivot position negative three. So X and Y both correspond to pivot columns. They're both basic. There are no free variables. An example of a system with infinitely many solutions, X plus Y equals two, two X plus two Y, equals four. We set up the augmented matrix and we perform one step of Gaussian elimination. I am going to take the first row, multiply it by two and add it to the second row. And when I do that, the second row is going to completely disappear. So what does that tell me? We 
This, now that we have the matrix in row echelon form, in fact, in reduced row echelon form, we can see that there is exactly one pivot position, that upper left composition. And that corresponds to the variable X. So we can see, first of all, this last column is not a pivot column. The only pivot position is in the first column. So that tells us that this system is consistent. And because there's only this one pivot position, and it's in the X column, X is basic, Y is free. Y does not correspond to a pivot position. So because this is a consistent system, with at least one free variable, there are going to be infinitely many solutions. And you can see that, I mean, this matrix is in reduced row echelon form. We're done with our solution technique. And when we transform these rows into equations, we get X plus Y equals two. And then that second row becomes the rather banal statement that zero equals zero. So uh, any values of X and Y that satisfy both of those equations are solutions to the system. The second equation, of course, might as well not be here. Zero equals zero is always true. So any solution to that first equation is a solution to the system. And there are certainly infinitely many solutions. This is a line on the Cartesian plane. Any point on the line is a solution. And that takes us through section 1.2. We're going to hustle right on into 1.3. We have to cover a little more than a section a day in this class in order to cover all of the material. A one semester linear algebra course needs to cover. I am for our online.